So now that we've covered the classification side of this lecture, we've gone over and reviewed things that we've mentioned in Biology 115, a bit of new stuff, we're going to start a totally new idea for you in Biology 116. That's going to be the idea and theme of viruses and virology, the study of viruses. And so in order to begin that, we'll of course begin with an introductory flowchart that will be virology intro. And that's what we'll entitle our first virus flowchart, virology introduction. So in order to understand virology, I think it's very important to ground ourselves on some basic characteristics that viruses uh, establish and show uh, almost all the time. So these are our characteristics that are going to ground our knowledge. The characteristics of viruses are as follows. First and foremost, it's interesting to note that uh, for the most part, most people will agree on this, is that viruses themselves are not on the tree of life because they are actually not alive. Not on tree of life because not alive. So they are non-living. But then why are they being studied in a biology course? Biology, if I remember correctly, is the study of life. And if these are non-life, if these are not alive, how can they be classified as something biological at all? Well, that's something that we'll look at as we move forward in this virology study. But first and foremost, I want to make sure we understand why viruses are not alive. Because first of all, viruses contain and are not, first of all, they're not cells at all. They don't contain cells. They are not cells. They have no nucleus. They have no organelles whatsoever. Viruses also can't metabolize on their own. So they can't metabolize. That's an important characteristic of life, the idea of metabolism. Taking things in and breaking them down or building things within you. All of these things that we study, these metabolic processes, we studied a lot in Bio 115. They can't do. They can't metabolize. And I'm going to put this also because this is important to write on their own. Okay, So they can't metabolize on their own and they can't reproduce on their own. So these are critical, critical life characteristics that they don't have on their own, okay, on their own. Then we can sort of, we can now sort of change the story by looking at the fact that, okay, maybe they can't do these things, but there are some characteristics of viruses that seem lifelike at least. One of those characteristics is the fact that viruses contain very familiar genetic material. And again, remember, genetic material such as, let's say, DNA, or in viruses, it's or RNA are both, you know, key characteristics of life, right? To have DNA and RNA, some sort of information system to store information that gives us the ability to make proteins and whatever. We studied all that in Bio 115. But why does this not classify them as life? Well, that's because they can't replicate their DNA. That's a metabolic process on their own. They can't translate their RNA into protein. That's a metabolic process on their own. All of these things can't be done on their own. Another thing I want to make sure you understand is that viruses have DNA or RNA. Big key here is that it's or. It is never, never, never both. So we'll write that down just to make sure it's very clear. Viruses never have both DNA and RNA. They either have DNA or RNA. Very important distinction of this or. In addition, viruses, as you probably all know, are very, very small. You cannot see a virus through typical means, let's say. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. They're about 20 to 300 nanometers in length. That is absolutely useless for you to know because what is a nanometer? Nonetheless, we can understand this small size by not saying that it's 20 to 300 nanometers, but it's so small, let's say, the viruses are so small that they can't possibly be seen under a light microscope. Can't be seen under light microscope. Thus far, all of the things that we have studied 
let's say, human metabolism or humans or bacteria or plants or whatever. They can all typically be seen under a light microscope, whether it's a tissue uh, cell from a tissue, whether it's a plant cell, whether it's a bacteria. A light microscope can pretty much catch all of them, but it cannot see a virus because it's only 20 to 300 nanometers in size. Final characteristic that's of great importance to, to truly, truly remember is that viruses are beautifully categorized as what I would consider, or what people consider, not just myself, obligate intracellular parasites. Do not forget this. This is a phrase to remember. You have to remember that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. Very nicely written, very, very important terminology here. Obligate meaning they always have to be within intra cells, and thus when they are always within cells, if they are within the cell, they are parasitic in nature. Okay, so we're going to write this down as the fact that they must, viruses must be what we would consider associated with a host of some sort. So there needs to be a host in this virus versus host relationship. They must be associated with the host. And then also, once within a host, we would consider them parasitic. They are parasitic within host cell, which will I'll just abbreviate as HC from this point forward. They are parasitic within host cell. If we remember from our ecological studies, this would be a plus-minus relationship, meaning that somebody's going to benefit and somebody's going to not benefit. Somebody's actually going to be detrimented by the fact that there's a benefit going on. This, of course, would be the virus. The virus is successful in metabolizing and reproducing because it has a host to manipulate and use, whereas the host is not so happy because it has to give up its machinery. And we'll look at that in greater detail as we move forward. So those are some major characteristics, introductory characteristics of viruses to be aware of. Finally, last thing to understand about this introduction is the actual discovery of viruses. It's always good to premise our study of anything in biology on the history of what's going on. And I know that sounds boring, and it's not, though. That's the thing. It's important to understand the history because it gives us a great appreciation for how much we've moved forward since, let's say, the discovery of viruses. So the major first discovery in virology altogether was with something known as the tobacco mosaic virus. TMV, and I'll write that down, is the tobacco mosaic virus. And this is a plant virus that affects the tobacco plant. It infects the tobacco plant. So we'll write that down just to make that clear. Infects tobacco plants. So this is a virus and it needs tobacco plants. Infects not tobacco virus. It infects tobacco plants. And a little bit of history. So we have to denote who discovered the TMV, and that was Mr. Adolf Mayer. Adolf Mayer was our discoverer, the major scientist behind the TMV realization. Um, he was actually able to be the first person to transmit a virus in the lab, let's say. He physically transmitted TMV, the tobacco mosaic virus, from an infected plant to, of course, a healthy plant from infected plant to a healthy plant. So that is a milestone in virology, in virus studying. The fact that there's a transmittance that happens, and Adolf Mayer was the first person to do this, utilizing a very early discovery uh, known as the tobacco mosaic virus. This was about in 1883. So very, very long time ago, yet very crucial in our understanding of everything that we know about virology today. Last discovery to understand in virology uh, and its history is through the work of another in, uh, individual, another scientist, who was Martinus uh, Bejernik. So we'll write this down. Bejernik. And he did his work in the late 19th century. Um, the best way to understand his work is actually to look at the figure. So I highly suggest looking at figure 19.2. It very nicely summarizes his experiment 
with viruses. And I'll just give you some basic conclusions once you look at that figure to walk away with. The basic conclusions of his experiment, as shown in figure 19.2, are as follows. He noticed that there is something uh, that he would consider a disease agent. He didn't necessarily call it a virus, but for right now, we'll just call it a disease agent, something that causes disease. He noted and concluded that the disease agent was certainly and most definitely smaller, must have been smaller than uh, other disease agents that we are co familiar with, known as bacteria. And this was because if you look at the experiment, the bacteria couldn't pass through this filter that he created. Bacteria couldn't pass, they got stuck uh, through the filter, whereas the disease agent did pass through the filter. Bacteria couldn't pass through filter. And this is again highlighted in figure 19.2. Um, what he did notice was that the agent, the virus, let's say, that's what I'm putting agent for, but we're not going to just call it a virus just yet. The agent in question, he noticed also and concluded, must and, and does replicates in plants. So plant virology was very important in our discovery of viruses. Um, and also, one important final conclusion and a uh, very important thing to understand about viruses, this idea that they can't reproduce on their own and can't metabolize on their own, was concluded in essence by Bejernik because he was actually unable to grow. Typically, we can grow bacteria in a lab, right? But he was actually unable to grow this um, very uh, disease-like agent um, in the most perfect conditions possible that conditions that bacteria usually prefer like a nutrient medium this is a uh, a plate let's say that has all these nutrients on it and the agent still doesn't grow on it um, he wasn't able to grow it in a test tube so he put it in a test tube it still didn't work and he even tried a petri dish none of those worked um, and thus we can already tell from this understanding that it can't reproduce on its own and it can't metabolize on its own. It can't grow on its own. In other words, it needs a host. So look at figure 19.2. This gives us a good overall introduction to the characteristics and the major discoveries, initial discoveries at least, associated with virology.